Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we are looking at a few entry level Z490 motherboards and of course the focus will be on VRM thermal performance. Now there are a number of rather cheap Z490 motherboards, at least cheap by flagship Intel chipset standards, and I'll be honest with you guys, some of them do look pretty trash, and spoiler alert, they are. Like, more trash than you could possibly imagine. Back when I was first testing the 10th gen Core i5 and Core i9 parts for our day one coverage, I had a conversation with Tim about Z490 motherboard pricing as we were discussing the cons and pros of these new Intel CPUs versus the current AMD offerings. We both quickly noticed that there were some surprisingly affordable Z490 motherboards, so that's obviously good news for budget builders wanting to get something like a Core i5-10600K and then overclock the snot out of it. The ASRock Z490 Phantom Gaming 4, for example, that costs just $150 US, and that's not much more than what you'd pay for a quality AMD B450 motherboard. However, we quickly noticed that the feature set was pretty dismal. At $150, that's still quite a bit of money to spend on a motherboard, and you're getting just three USB Type-A ports on the I.O. panel, basic audio, and then a single M.2 slot. But if the board allows you to get the most out of the 10600K, then that would make it a pretty great option for budget builders. However, even that seems a bit doubtful. The included heat sinks are tiny, and although ASRock advertises the board to have a 10 power phase design featuring sturdy components and completely smooth power delivery to the CPU, plus it offers unmatched overclocking capabilities and enhanced performance with lowest temperature for advanced gamers as well. All ASRock's words there. Oh, and did I mention it also packs premium 50 amp power chokes, which ASRock says when compared to traditional chokes, effectively makes saturation current up to three times better, thus providing enhanced and improved V-core voltage to the motherboard. So that all sounds pretty good and unmatched overclocking capabilities for a $150 US Z490 motherboard would be rather special. Therefore, I emailed ASRock and asked if they could sample the board and to my surprise, they questioned why I wanted the board, stating that, and I quote, it is a budget motherboard, not for intense overclocking. But why would ASRock tell me that? It's a 10 power phase design offering unmatched overclocking capabilities. How is it not designed for intense overclocking? Certainly a bit of mixed messaging going on there. Anyway, I told ASRock we weren't interested in extreme overclocking and we would like to provide an entry level VRM temperature test for our viewers. They continue to dodge the sample request. Basically, they refuse to sample the board without actually saying it. So we did what we always do here at Harbour Unboxed, and with the help of our amazing Patreon supporters, we just went out and purchased the Z490 Phantom Gaming 4 along with the Z490 Pro 4, another board ASRock refused to send over. And what we found will almost certainly shock you, but we'll get to that in a moment. As for the other contenders, we have the Gigabyte Z490 UD, which was provided by Gigabyte without a fuss. So we certainly appreciate that. We also have the MSI Z490-A Pro, which MSI were more than pleased to provide. And then the ASUS Prime Z490-P, which we actually had to purchase. ASUS didn't exactly refuse to sample the board. There was just going to be some delays in getting it. So rather than wait, we just went ahead and bought it, allowing us to get this information to you without any further delay. Okay, so before we get into the testing, let's just quickly go over each board. The ASUS Prime Z490P is one of the cheapest Z490 motherboards on the market, priced at just $160 US. And I've got to say, for that price, it looks like one hell of a motherboard, at least relative to other affordable Z490 motherboards. The I.O. panel features four USB 3.2 ports and two USB 2.0 ports, which is by no means impressive for a board of this price. But again, it is by Z490 standards. You also get two M.2 slots for SSDs, an additional two front USB 3.2 headers, and four SATA 6 gigabits per second ports. So again, none of that sounds particularly amazing, but believe me, it is quite impressive by entry-level Z490 standards. And it is particularly impressive when you look at the VRM. The board uses the ASP 1900B controller in a 5 plus 1 configuration, and although we're only talking about a five-phase V-Core VRM, it does pack 10 on semiconductor NCP 30, 20, 45, 45 amp power stages for a total current capacity of 450 amps. That is a significant upgrade over any of the entry-level Z390 motherboards, and it should mean that the ASUS Prime Z490P will be able to handle even an overclocked Core i9-10900K. As for the heat sinks, they are a bit basic, weighing a combined 114 grams, but given the thermal output they'll be dealing with when using most 10th gen core processors, I'm confident they will get the job done. 
Moving on to the Gigabyte Z490UD. This board is currently priced at $170 US, so just $10 over the ASUS board, and in terms of features, it is quite well stocked. The I.O. panel features a pre-installed shield, which is a nice touch, and there are half a dozen USB 3.2 ports. Gigabyte has also included three M.2 ports, two of which can be used now with PCIe 3.0 support, while the top slot will be usable with future LGA 1200 processors supporting PCIe 4.0. Gigabyte also offers the full six SATA ports, so two more than what you get with the SUS. So like I said, a decent loadout for a $170 Z490 motherboard, but what about the VRM? For this model, Gigabyte's using the Intercell ISL69269 P-Dome controller, which can drive a total of 12 distinct phases, and from it, 11 signals are taken for the V-Core portion of the VRM. Each phase is driven by an on-semiconductor 4C10N MOSFET, and that's on the high side, and then an on-semiconductor 4C06N MOSFET on the low side. This is a very similar VRM configuration to that of the Gigabyte Z390UD. The newer Z490 version though does get an extra phase and doesn't have to rely on the use of doublers. And for those of you wondering, the Z390UD wasn't particularly impressive overall, despite being the best budget Z390 motherboard, and that testing was conducted with the 9900K. So it'll be interesting to see how the Z490UD stacks up. At least Gigabyte has attempted to give the Z490UD a shot at overclocking K-SKU parts with some decent heat sinks. Combined they weigh 200 grams, so you're getting 75% more aluminium on the UD when compared to the ASUS Prime. There's also quite a bit more surface area here as well. They aren't real finned heat sinks, but there are a number of grooves which do increase the surface area, so overall not a terrible solution. Then we have the MSI Z490-A Pro, and this board comes in at $160 US, so $10 less than the Gigabyte Z490UD, and the same price as the ASUS Prime Z490-P. In terms of features, pretty basic and quite similar to the ASUS board. When compared to the Gigabyte model, the Z490-A Pro drops two SATA ports and two of the USB 3.2 ports on the I.O. panel. MSI's really gone with the bare minimum spec for this board, but that doesn't mean they skimped when it came to the VRM. They've gone with a cheaper RichTech RT3609B PWM controller, which supports eight phases, not 12 like what we see with the Gigabyte board. This limits MSI to six phases for the V-Core portion of the VRM, and an option here would be to employ doublers to create a 12-phase VRM. However, MSI has gone with a more cost-effective approach by simply doubling the number of MOSFETs used per phase, and this increases the current handling of the board without increasing the phase count, and this is something we often see with ASUS motherboards. ASUS calls their method teamed power, whereas MSI is marketing as duet rail power system. Anyway, when compared to the Gigabyte motherboard, which also uses on semiconductor MOSFETs, MSI is upgraded to the 4C029N and 4C024N drivers. Moreover, MSI's approach has allowed them to include an additional pair of these high quality MOSFETs, and I roughly estimate that that could increase the current capacity by as much as 20%. That's obviously very significant, so it'll be interesting to see how these boards compare. MSI has also included 237 grams worth of aluminium heat sinks, which feature a number of grooves designed to increase the surface area. So the cooling capacity should be at least as good as what you'll get with the Gigabyte and ASUS boards. Now, the cheapest Z490 motherboard on the market today is the ASRock Z490 Phantom Gaming 4 at just $150 US. Be aware though, there are a few different versions of this board, some with Wi-Fi and then another one with 2.5 gigabit networking, but in terms of VRM design and cooling, they're all identical. They're also identical when it comes to all other features, and unfortunately, that is to say there's almost no noteworthy features. When compared to the MSI and ASUS boards, the Phantom Gaming 4 IOs panel is a barren wasteland. There's more empty space here than anything else. Then on board, you're looking at a single M.2 slot, but you do get all six SATA 6 gigabits per second ports, so I guess there is that. The VRM cooling looks like something you'd expect to find on an H410 board, if I'm honest, and the VRM itself doesn't look like something you'd expect to see on a Z490 motherboard either. ASRock's again going with a doubling scheme, where they take four signals from the controller and then split them using phase doublers, which is fine. However, that leaves them with just eight banks of MOSFETs, whereas ASUS has 10, Gigabyte has 11, and MSI has 12. But more importantly, the components used are far worse than what you'll find on any of the competing boards. On the high side, Azerox's using eight Photons PDEC3908X MOSFETs, and on the low side, they're PDE3906X MOSFETs. And as far as I can tell, these FETs are complete garbage. 
And speaking privately with Buildzoid, he estimates that the low side FETs will generate twice as much heat as the model seen on the Gigabyte board for the same amount of current. Speaking of heat, cooling all these MOSFETs is a combined 79 grams worth of aluminium heat sinks. And once again, we're not talking about real finned heat sinks here. So I am very interested to see how this board goes. Now I'm also including a second ASRock motherboard in this testing as they offer a $170 US ATX board in the Z490 Pro 4. And that being the case, it did seem unfair to just include the $150 Z490 Phantom Gaming 4. So what's ASRock offering for the extra $20? Well, the IO panel is virtually the same. We're just getting a VGA port, which is gonna be useless for most of you because A, you won't be using the iGPU, and B, if you do, you'll likely use the HDMI port. The key improvements here have been made to the VRM in both the components used and the cooling. Starting with the cooling, as you can clearly see, the heat sinks are much bigger, and here we're getting a combined 270 grams worth of aluminium, roughly three and a half times more than the Z490 Phantom Gaming 4. There's also a few fins cut into the blocks, but they are mostly just that, a block of aluminium. As for the VRM, we're getting a copy and paste job from the Z390 Pro 4. So it's an eight phase V-Core VRM using Sino Power MOSFETs. The Z390 Pro 4, like most entry level Z390 motherboards, wasn't very good, but at least that particular board cost just $120 US. And that means we're now getting pretty much the same board for $170. For those who missed the Z390 VRM testing, the Pro 4 reached 81 degrees using a stock Core i9-9900K inside a case with decent airflow and an ambient temperature of just 21 degrees. And then we saw when overclocking the 9900K to 5 GHz with just 1.3 volts, the board actually failed. So I don't have particularly high hopes for this Z490 version. Before we get into the graphs, let's talk a bit about the test conditions. For this testing and any future LGA1200 VRM thermal testing, I've built a dedicated system with the help of Corsair, who sent over their Obsidian Series 500D mid-tower case, RM850X power supply, IQH150i RGB Pro XT all-in-one liquid cooler, and 32 gigabytes of their Vengeance RGB Pro DDR4-3200 memory. The Obsidian 500D has been configured with a single rear 120mm exhaust fan and two top mounted 140mm exhaust fans. Then in the front of the case is the H150i 360mm radiator with three 120mm intake fans. This is a pretty standard configuration, airflow is going to be good, and in a 21 degree room I'd say this is an optimal setup. Then for recording temperatures, I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples, and I'll be reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. Finally, I'm not reporting delta T over ambient. Instead, I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees, as this, in my opinion, is by far the most accurate way to conduct this testing. And monitoring ambient room temperatures is a thermocouple position next to the test system. Okay, so what we have here is the out-of-the-box performance. The only setting change in the BIOS is the XMP setting. Here I've simply loaded the DDR4-3200 profile, and this doesn't alter the CPU power limits of any of the boards. Now, to be clear, this isn't an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. We're looking at three different default power configurations, so that is important to note. The ASUS Prime Z490-P, like all ASUS LGA1200 motherboards, runs by default at Intel's base TDP specification. So for the 10900K, that limits it to a package power of 125 watts, resulting in a sustained all-core clock frequency of 4.4 gigahertz. This saw the VRM peak at just 59 degrees, which is a very cool result, but again, all 10 cores were clocked at just 4.4 gigahertz. The next hottest board is the MSI Z490A Pro, and like I said, this isn't an apples to apples comparison, as the MSI board was clocking the 10900K 7% higher at 4.7 gigahertz, and that saw the average package power increase to 166 watts, which is 33% higher than what was seen with the ASUS board. The Gigabyte Z490UD was also TDP limited, and despite that, the VRM temperature reached 81 degrees, so that's a bit of an alarming discovery. However, what we found with the ASRock boards was truly cause for alarm. The ASRock Z490 Phantom Gaming 4 dropped the stock 10900K right down to its base clock frequency of 3.7 GHz, and even then VRM throttling was detected, limiting the operating temperature to 84 degrees. Quite shockingly, the Z490 Pro 4 was really no better as it too dropped the 10900K down to just 3.7 GHz, though VRM throttling wasn't detected. 
And the reason the Pro 4 ran hotter was because it didn't start dropping the voltage. Whereas the package power fell as low as 90 watts for the Phantom Gaming 4, it only dropped to 103 watts with the Pro 4. This means the Phantom Gaming 4 was risking system stability during this workload, and with a lower quality CPU, might have even crashed. Either way, both boards were terrible in this test, dropping the 10900K to its base clocks while running at high temperatures. Basically, the MSI Z490A Pro was clocking all 10 cores 1 GHz higher, while also managing to run 24 degrees cooler. For a more apples to apples comparison, I removed all the power limits for the 10900K and retested. Given what we found previously, it'll come as no surprise to learn that the ASRock boards failed this test, crashing in Windows and forcing a system reset. The Gigabyte Z490UD did manage to pass this test, maintaining 4.9 GHz for the one hour duration, though it did peak at 103 degrees, which is a little too toasty for prolonged use. The ASUS Prime Z490P and MSI Z490A Pro both passed this test with relative ease, peaking in the mid-70s, so a stellar result there. The next step was to actually overclock the 10900K, and I did so by pushing it to 5.1 GHz using 1.35 volts. Unfortunately, this was too much for the Gigabyte Z490UD, as it tapped out, promptly enforcing a current limit before crashing, causing the system to reset. However, the MSI and ASUS boards both passed the hour-long stress test, peaking at around 90 degrees after about 30 minutes. So that's a pass and a surprisingly good result for these sub $200 US motherboards. Now, what if you wanted to pair one of these entry-level Z490 motherboards with the most affordable unlocked 10th gen processor, the Core i5-10600K? Well, you're most likely going to do this so you can overclock it, so we pushed our processor up to a modest 5 GHz using 1.35 volts and ran the tests again. As expected, based on what we've already seen, the ASUS and MSI boards handled this overclock with ease, peaking at just over 60 degrees. The Gigabyte Z490UD was less convincing, hitting 86 degrees, but it did hold the overclock and maintained 5 GHz without an issue. The ASRock Z490 Pro 4, on the other hand, ran the 10600K at 5 GHz for about 5 minutes before VRM throttling was detected and the CPU speed started to drop down, and then by the 15 minute mark, the processor frequency rarely clocked above 4 GHz. And worse still, if, if you can believe it, the ASRock Z490 Phantom Gaming 4 couldn't even handle the 5 GHz overclock, even with 1.375 volts. It had loaded into Windows, only to crash seconds after starting the Blender stress test. That is a dismal result for a board advertised to offer unmatched overclocking capabilities and enhanced performance with the lowest temperature for advanced gamers. Okay, so that's all the test information. Let's discuss the results and what they mean. I think we'll start with the good because that's just gonna be quick and easy. We'll get that out of the way. The ASUS Prime Z490P and MSI Z490A Pro are both excellent motherboards. They really are amazingly good quality uh, Z490 motherboards, especially given the $160 US price tag. You can really throw any 10th gen core processor on them without worrying about the VRM overheating, throttling, or worse. Granted, they are both very basic boards, but in terms of quality, they simply cannot be beaten at this price point. As for which one you should pick, it's really hard to say. Personally, I feel they are so evenly matched that it comes down to personal preferences, like which BIOS do you prefer, for example. The MSI board delivers more performance out of the box, but a simple toggle switch in the ASUS BIOS will lay to remove the power limits, so that shouldn't really be a deciding factor either. As for the Gigabyte Z490UD, it's not a bad board, and frankly, I didn't expect any of these entry-level Z490 boards to support a 5.1 GHz overclock with the Core i9-10900K. So, for most users, the UD will work perfectly fine, and for those wanting to get a Core i5-10600K and overclock the hell out of it, you won't be disappointed. Still, if you plan on running core-heavy workloads for extended periods of time, then I would recommend avoiding this board in favour of the slightly cheaper MSI and ASUS models. For gaming though, it shouldn't be a problem, but let's be honest, there's really no point spending $10 more on a board with a much weaker VRM. Speaking of weak VRMs, I guess it's time we address the disaster that is ASRock's entry-level Z490 lineup. I never expected the ASRock Z490 Phantom Gaming 4 to overclock the snot out of the Core i9-10900K, despite ASRock's bold claims on their product page, but I had hoped it would be able to at least overclock the 10600K, and I had really hoped that it would be able to handle a stock 10900K without any VRM throttling. As you just saw, it did none of those things. The board is a disgrace and certainly doesn't deserve to wear the Z490 badge. It's an H410 quality board at best. 
I guess you could argue that it's the cheaper Z490 board, but honestly I don't know why you would. Firstly, it's a Z490 motherboard, and Z490 boards are designed to take advantage of unlocked KSKU parts. But okay, what about locked parts like the Core i5-10400? The Phantom Gaming 4 allows users to take advantage of memory overclocking with these chips, something no H410 or B460 board offers. That's a reasonable argument, I guess. Well, it is until you realize that the MSI Z490A Pro and ASUS Prime Z490P cost just $10 more, so you'd be mad to buy the ASRock board just for memory overclocking. Basically, the ASRock Z490 Phantom Gaming 4 is indefensible garbage and a complete ripoff at $150 US. I wouldn't pay a dollar over $100 for the thing. ASRock also needs to rein in their BS marketing, claiming that the board offers unmatched overclocking capabilities and enhanced performance with the lowest temperatures for advanced gamers. It's a flat out lie, it's misleading, and it really does need to stop. And if the Z490 Phantom Gaming 4 wasn't trash enough, ASRock also has the Z490 Pro 4 at $170 US. This board's more expensive than the MSI and ASUS models, but in terms of VR and performance, it's just nowhere, hitting 90 degrees with the 10900K running at its base clock and then crashing with the power limits removed. And worse still, it failed to pass our 10600K OC testing. For me, ASRock's always been known as sort of a reliable midfield contender. They might not have the biggest and best quality VRMs, but they've always been big on value, offering loads of features at competitive prices. And we've seen this for over a decade now. And for me, this is really the first time I can really recall any of their products being, well, absolute trash. I know that's quite harsh to say, but you guys have seen the results. I think that's just, yet. Yeah, I think it's fair to say at this point. And I think it is fair to say that ASRock probably, or at least it seems like, they just didn't care about the Z490 platform, maybe the 10th gen platform in general. Still, that doesn't excuse the false marketing and the fact that they actively tried to avoid this content being created. And they sent us virtually every board except for the ones that we asked for. Anyway, it's great to see that there are some solid Z490 motherboards available at reasonable prices for those wanting to grab something like the Core i5-10600K and overclock it, while also having the option to upgrade in the future to something a little more high-end, should they choose to. And that is going to do it for this one. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. A lot of work, time and effort, all that stuff went into this one. Uh, yeah, not as gruelling as, say, a 30-game benchmark, but still, yeah, very, very time-consuming a lot of testing, making sure that things are accurate and conditions are correct and the boards are doing all the right things, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, a lot of work put into it is what I'm trying to say. I think I already said that, but yeah, a lot of work. Uh, and thank you to our Patreon members for supporting this work and also allowing us to, you know, buy boards like these ones when the manufacturers are happy to sell them to you guys, but they're not happy for us to actually test them and test their claims. So we like to do that. Again, ASUS would have provided this board, but there was a delay, so we didn't want to. I really thought, I really wanted to make sure that people weren't going and buying these boards because they are absolute trash, as I said. So I wanted to get this content out there as quick as possible. And I will have uh, some follow-up content looking at many more boards priced at an up to about $200. I think there's another six or seven boards that I've been adding to the testing. But anyway, thank you to our Patreon members. If you would like to support this work directly, then head over to the link in the video description. You get a lot of cool perks as well, monthly live streams, behind the scenes videos, exclusive Discord chat where you can talk to the Harbour Box community about content like this, talk about other things, really anything tech related, very cool community. So check it out if you're interested. What else? Oh, I should give a thank you to Buildzoid over at Actually Hardcore Overclocking. He's always made himself available to me if I have any questions or, just anything about this kind of testing, and obviously he's a great resource. I'll put his uh, channel link in the video description because you know, if you like this sort of stuff, he's the person you want to be looking at. Um, and I, I don't think there's much more to say on this one. Just thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.